So welcome back, everyone. So for this next portion of our program, uh, we're bringing together a panel, uh, an all-star panel, uh, focused on global perspectives on citizenship. Um, I think particularly given the comments we've just heard from Judy and Tom, that we recognize that concepts around citizenship and community participation really vary significantly dependent on your context. Um, and that can, of course, bring in multiple factors, things like locale, what world region you're from, uh, your gender, your age, your socioeconomic status, and so on. Um, so we take this broad array of perspectives, and then we add one more that's critically important, and that's the focus of our discussion today, and one that cross-cuts all of those, and that is the experience of being a person with a disability. Um, and from the initial quadra of disability and civil rights adv advocates up through today's ADA generation, um, it's clear that concepts around citizenship today and what that means and how you strive for reaching those rights and, and advocate for your needs, it looks different now than it did 30 or 40 years ago. And then you layer in contextual factors related to um, global citizenship and that brings another layer. So this panel is really to focus on all of those multi-dimensional aspects of what it means uh, to be a citizen and to fully participate in your community as a person with a disability here now in 2018 and how we got here. So um, I'm gonna keep my intros brief because you wanna hear from these panelists. Um, and the bios are in your program, as was mentioned earlier, so please take a moment to look at those. Uh, but briefly, we're gonna be starting on this side of the table and moving down. Uh, we'll first hear from Maria Town. Welcome, Maria. Maria is the director of the mayor's office for people with disabilities for the city of Houston, uh, where she advocates for the rights and needs of citizens with disabilities related to everything from hurricane relief to immigration to incarceration, a number of topics, uh, particularly at the local level. Um, but I think everyone who knows Maria knows that she's a rising star in the field and already has a great depth of leadership um, on these topics. Um, and she was the former senior associate director in the Obama White House Office of Public Engagement, so also with some federal experience as well. Uh, next to Maria is Ari Neiman, um, who's a well-known leader in the self-advocacy moment um, and currently serves as CEO of MySupport.com, something that's definitely worth checking out when you have a moment. Um, Ari um, is involved in numerous consulting roles across many sectors related to disability policy and is really seen um, as an expert in this regard, particularly working with groups such as the American Civil Liberties Union. His voice is really out there, actually just read your blog post, Ari, from the Health Affairs blog a couple of days ago. Um, so really cross-cutting issues of disability policy across multiple sectors and with um, a real wealth of experience. Um, Charlotte McLean Nalapo, uh, far to my left, um, is, a, is a, a long-term friend and global disability advisor to the World Bank Group, um, where she focuses on disability inclusive development and also was previously appointed by President Obama to lead USAID's work on disability. Um, including how you think about developing policies in various regions around the world and country strategies at the local level for program implementation. Uh, Charlotte just arrived here to Boston from Rome, um, as is usually the case. I feel like Charlotte's always <laughs> coming in from somewhere fabulous around the world. Um, and so we really appreciate um, her being here despite jet lag and, and taking the effort to join us. So really thrilled to get this session started. What we're gonna do is hear from each of our panelists individually uh, for about 15 minutes, um, just to hear their overall thoughts and, and how they um, think about citizenship from their lens. Um, after that, we'll have a, a moderated discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass it along to you, Maria. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> So I thought to kick my comments off, I would reference a Harvard alum. Um, in his farewell address, President Barack Obama said, it falls to each of us to be those anxious, jealous guardians of our democracy. Embrace the joyous task we have been given to continually try to improve this great nation of ours, because for all of our outward differences, we in fact share the same proud type the most important office in a democracy, citizen. Citizen. So you see, that's what our democracy demands. It needs you, not just when there's an election, not just when you can serve your own narrow interests, but over the full span of a lifetime. If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking to one of them in real life. <laughs> and uh, when he left office, he said, and now I'm going to take on my most important title, more important than president, more important than prime minister, citizen. 
Um, and I think that that's an interesting quote to sort of start this conversation because when we talk about citizenship, I think that there's an, a, an assumption embedded in that, um, which is the assumption of active citizenship, right? Um, when we talk about people being citizens, we're assuming that there's some sort of activity in production connected to um, what they are doing because they are an active participant in our governments or many governments' social contracts. And that assumption of activity and production um, has been used to discriminate against people with disabilities from the very beginning um, because, as Judy mentioned, we have been marked as people who just have needs, right, as people who are solely consumers. <clears throat> And when you contextualize it in the American kind of Protestant work ethic uh, moment, uh, the idea that people with disabilities cannot contribute and cannot be productive um, really endangers our own ability to engage in active citizenship. And it's interesting, if you look at photos from many of the protests in the initial um, disability civil rights movement, you see signs that say, we want to be taxpayers too. <laughs> right, and we laugh at that and we can think that maybe the only people in the world who want to be taxpayers are people <laughs> with disabilities. Um, so I'm giving you a kind of broad historical perspective because really when we talk about disability and citizenship together, in many ways disability status and identity has been seen as antithetical to citizenship. Um, and so now I want to talk about some more specific issues um, that I'm dealing with at a local level that I think highlight this. Um, one, and they're all current, um, I find it interesting that every Harvard student that I've met who has been disabled has been an immigrant. Now, mind you, I've only met four. That's a very limited sample. <laughs> um, but all of them, every single one of them, have been, uh, had a disability. And, um, most of them share the same story, which is that I had a disability and my family decided to move to America because they knew that I would have more rights here and be able to access education and have a chance at getting a job um, because of things like the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so um, when I think about immigration, um, disability is a huge part of that. There are people who come to the United States, people with disabilities, um, because they have a better chance of succeeding here than they do um, in their home country. And in Houston, one in four Houstonians was not born in the United States. Um, I would say that in many, many ways we are a city of immigrants. We have the largest refugee population in the United States. Um, and so currently the Trump administration is considering a rule called the public charge rule, which would prevent uh, immigrants who receive public supports, uh, like the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program or housing vouchers, from attaining visas, green cards, and full citizenship. So what is that actually an attack on? That's an attack on poor immigrants, and that's an attack on disabled immigrants, right? Um, and at the, in the city of Houston, um, we stand, one, firmly against this proposed rule and recognize not only how it will impact those individuals who have been so brave uh, to leave their home and to come here, um, but our, whole, our citizenry as a whole. Um, and so I want to give you some numbers or, or in some examples. What we found um, for other bills, whether they're at the state level or at the federal level, for bills that target immigrants, um, what we see is individuals not seeking city services that they are entitled to, like vaccinations, right? Like TB vaccinations. That puts all of us at a health risk. By the way, vaccinate your children, please. <laughs> and uh, we also, there was a, a bill at the Texas state level called SB4, um, which targeted immigrants. And what we found is that there were 70% fewer reports of domestic violence in the Latinx community in Houston. Does that mean that domestic violence was happening at a lesser rate? Absolutely not. It means that people were scared to report. It means that people were getting hurt. 
And so now, um, if you think that people maybe won't try to access things like SNAP or WIC, it means that children won't get access to the food they need. Um, that's putting our whole citizenry at risk. Mm -hmm. And so kind of hearkening to what Judy was saying, until we can get to the point where we realize that um, social justice movements connected to citizenship need to embrace disability, um, not just for individuals, but also so our whole democracy can continue to sustain itself, um, we're gonna continue having discussions like this. Um, there's also an economic piece to this. Um, we note that immigrants in Houston generate $14.75 million in economic activity, preventing them from accessing public programs that support economic stability will destabilize our whole economy. Again, it will infringe upon everyone's ability to be an active citizen. Um, another very recent and wonderful piece of news is that felons in Florida now can vote, right? Exactly. So um, I think it was uh, referendum number four on their ballot, right? Uh, restored voting rights to people who, uh, felons who had served their time. Uh, Florida is not the only state to do this. We do this in Texas. What that means is that one million people can now vote. That is 9.2% of Florida's voting age population. Wow. Mm -hmm. And when we look at criminal justice, at least 80% of people in the criminal justice system are people with disabilities. So the the ballot initiative in Florida, it's a race issue, it's a gender issue, it's a disability issue, it's an enfranchisement issue, and it's a citizenship issue, and all of those are connected. Um, so thinking about things we can do around enhancing um, people's ability to be active citizens in the context of disability, we need more ballot initiatives like referendum four. Um, I don't know, how much time do I have left? Six, okay, great. <laughs> um, something that I've given a lot of thought to and that I think everyone on this panel could speak to um, is people with disabilities' rights to privacy. And privacy, I think, today is on everyone's mind in new ways because of hacks uh, at Facebook and Google, um, working for the federal government at the Office of Personal, Personnel Management. Um, so I think everyone has a greater sense of how tentative their privacy really is. People with disabilities, I think, often just abandon their sense of privacy um, because so often the programs that we are forced to rely on in order to survive require us to describe in great detail aspects of our lives that are often our most private moments. Um, and so when we think about things like right to privacy, for people with disabilities, that's not the most resonant concept. <laughs> However, um, you would think that for folks who maybe don't get to access as much privacy as everybody else, um, we wouldn't need to tell our stories because everyone else would already know them. The opposite is true. Um, while Doctors need to know measurements of our bodies and the regularity of our bowel movements um, when state agencies need to know exactly how much money we are making at every point in the day, um, when our communities establish working groups to check up on us because they want to make sure we're kept safe, you know, and it's make, it makes it harder to have an intimate night at home. Um, you would think that people would get our stories, but instead when we try to tell our stories to actually articulate ourselves and maybe expose our truths, people don't want to hear that. Um, and so um, what does being a private citizen look like as a person with a disability? Working in... Um, natural disasters and emergencies, as I've done in Houston, there are a lot of people who talk about registries for people with disabilities in order to make sure we can get rescued and be safe. 
And I think registries are very ineffective. I think that they are often a waste of taxpayer dollars. And I don't think that people with disabilities are inclined to use them because if you're a person with a disability, more likely than not, you already exist in many registries all over the country. Um, if someone were able to use data modeling and pulling information from Medicaid or from SNAP, you could absolutely pinpoint where most people with disabilities exist in the United States right now. Um, so again, what does it mean to be a private citizen for a person with a disability? Finally, um, this is a little bit different. When we think, again, about the historic, people with disabilities are only consumers, they're not producers, therefore citizenship is tough. Within the disability community, I think we actually have a group of super citizens, a group of people who have been very impactful to the disability rights movement, and those are veterans. Uh, these are individuals you know, who have chosen, um, although we can unpack that, uh, to <laughs> potentially sacrifice themselves for their country. And when they become wounded, whether in the line of service or not, uh, they become a person with a disability, and it is the government's responsibility to um, care for them because they have been such an active citizen. Um, and so the connection of veterans with disabilities to all these services, to the disability rights movement, is very different. And I think that their understanding of citizenship and their role in it is also very different. Um, and so for me, it's interesting to consider these, uh, these opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Uh, let's say people with disabilities like myself who were born with disabilities, who many would assume would be on benefits for my whole life, and that is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and on the opposite end, a very young, virile man who you know, became injured in the line of duty and therefore is valorized for his active citizenship. Um, so just think on that, and I think if we could figure out how to um, get a better conversation going between those two groups, among many others, uh, we can make progress on this issue. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Yes, thank you, Maria. I think... Um, a number of uh, really thoughtful topics. Uh, everyone let those roll around a little bit and maybe we can bring them into the Q&A and certainly we'll bring some of those into our discussion as well. Um, Ari, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for having me here. Um, one of the things that struck me about this morning's keynote was a comment Judy made about how people say those who discriminate against people with disabilities don't really mean it. And there's something very powerful in naming that, um, not least because the biggest challenge the disability rights movement has is helping the public understand that we are, in fact, a political issue. Disability is political. And in some ways, one of the things that's often been leveraged as the disability community's greatest asset, the perception that nobody wants to stand against the interests of disabled people in a public way, is also really our greatest weakness. Because if you don't acknowledge disability policy as a political issue as an area that is rife with potential conflict, and those of us who work in the world of disability policy know that that conflict can be very intense, but if you don't acknowledge that, then we end up with this impression that really, you know, there are no sides, um, everyone is acting with the best of intentions, um, and people who work on disability are engaged in some humanitarian rather than a political project. Um, Judy talked about the risks of that in the context of overt discrimination. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that in the context of some of the conflicts that emerge around disability service provision. Over the course of the last 50, at this point 60 years, I've been talking about this for about a decade, so. <laughs> but for the course of the last 60 years or so, we've seen a tremendous amount of change 
in the disability service provision system. Um, from 1960 to the present, over 200 state institutions for people with developmental disabilities were closed and their residents supported to live with greater dignity, autonomy, and independence in the community. If you look at 1977, data we have from 1977, um, the, in 1977, the average person with a developmental disability living outside a family home was living in a facility with 23 of their nearest and dearest perfect strangers they happened to share a disability diagnosis with. Today, the average residential setting size is two. There has been a tremendous shift in the way that disability services are delivered are approached and funded. Um, and by and large, that shift has been towards greater integration, greater autonomy, and greater choice for people with disabilities. Now, as we start to move into new kinds of shifts in the disability service system, and some of you here are aware of some of the controversies that disability services face today, such as the transition away from sheltered workshops towards community integrated employment, um, what some folks call second order deinstitutionalization, the shift away from smaller congregate settings like larger group homes to individualized um, uh, in-home services like supported community living or shared living host home models. All of that is running into controversy. Um, and it's very important for us to understand that all of the prior transitions that took place were also intensely controversial. Um, some of you know I'm in the process of writing a book on the history of the American disability experience from the Civil War to the present day. Um, and one of the things that you, you really jumps out at you is in every generation, going back to union veterans, disabled union veterans after the Civil War, We've had these same conflicts over what is the best way to support, care for, however we conceptualize it, assist people with disabilities. Um, more recently, in the 1980s, 1970s, 80s, and 90s, disability rights advocates fought in pretty much every state capital across the country on the question of deinstitutionalization. And the tricky thing about disability politics is that it doesn't always match up to the simple red-blue divides that we're used to in our country. Um, some of you may know that one of the uh, most intense opponents of deinstitutionalization and community living um, for people with disabilities in the 1970s and 80s were public sector employee unions um, who represented uh, workers and in institutions that didn't want to lose their job. In 1975, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees issued a pamphlet entitled Out of Their Beds and Into the Streets, um, working to try and scare family members of people with developmental disabilities that if institutions were closed, that uh, folks would be left without access to support. That's by and large not what happened. Um, we did see that to some degree in the mental health context because the community service system was not funded there. But in the DD context, we've generally seen a very positive deinstitutionalization experience. Um, but at the time, we saw controversy. So today, as we look at new kinds of controversy, it's important to have that historical context. Um, those of you who work in Medicaid policy uh, may be familiar with um, something called the Home and Community-Based Settings Rule. In 2014, the Obama administration issued a rule that was designed to speak to the fact that often what we call community living doesn't actually afford people the kinds of rights and opportunities that uh, we usually consider um, characteristic of life outside an institution. And that in the initial waves of deinstitutionalization, sometimes what we ended up doing 
It's taking people from a large building where someone else got to decide every aspect of their life and what they did for every minute of the day and put them in a small building <laughs> where someone else got to decide every aspect of their life and what they did for every minute of the day. And, and you know, well, we do have a fair amount of research that shows that folks are more likely to have choice and autonomy in smaller settings than in larger congregate settings. Community also has to be about the kinds of rights and opportunities people have. And so this rule, um, the Home and Community-Based Settings Rule, which every state has until 2022 to comply with, was initially going to be 2019. The current administration extended it to some degree. Um, is a multi-dimensional definition of community. It doesn't just talk about size, although size is one factor. Um, it also talks about the kinds of rights that people have. Do people have the right to have visitors in their own homes? Do people have the right to decide when they go to bed? Do people have the right to decide when they eat? Do people have the right to decide where they live? These basic concepts of choice, which most people um, with and without disabilities who aren't in residential service provision have the opportunity to make all the time, are really core to the question of whether or not a setting should be considered community or institutional in nature. Generally speaking, if you're 40 years old and you have a bedtime, you're institutionalized, even if we're calling it something else. And the response and the conflict that emerges here is you know, really oriented around this tension between autonomy and safety. And this really gets into one of the core questions of, of what it means to be considered, uh, I know our theme is citizenship, I don't want to limit it to citizens, but to be considered a person um, in the context of uh, our political and social and especially human services culture, which is to what extent do we allow people, what disability rights advocates have long called the dignity of risk. Because while there are certain things that people do need support to avoid, um, uh, where there are life and death, immediate life and death consequences, um, in fact, most of us make decisions about our lives that are oriented around more than just basic safety. How many of you have ever had something to eat that you later regretted? <laughs> How many of you have ever been a, in a romantic or sexual relationship that you've later regretted? How many of you have ever gone somewhere uh, that you've later regretted? You think to yourself, why did I waste my day like this? How many of you have ever done something dangerous? Do you think your life would be better if you didn't have the opportunity to make those choices? Mm -hmm. And so these are really one of the core things that's at stake when we talk about the future of disability policy. Are we going to be comfortable with a controversial, conflict, full, politicized disability policy conversation that has space for people to make choices that involve risk? Or are we going to go back to this idea um, that there are no sides and there are no politics when it comes to disability. We know that's not true, but it's important for us to really send a message to the public that that's not true. I, I wanna close by talking about how this plays out in academia, because I, I know many of you here have a very significant role to play in fields that are far beyond just disability studies or disability policy. Um, when we talk about political science and economics, uh, scholars have come up with a wide variety of really valuable methodological tools to help us understand conflict and uh, conflict between different values and different stakeholders in our society. Um, and one of the challenges that we run into is that those tools aren't always applied 
in the context of disability. Um, some of you who work in political science are familiar with the problem of uh, one person, one vote, one time, um, which is a concept that comes up um, in countries that are embarking on the transition to democracy, um, but uh, while they may have elections, have not built um, sufficiently strong norms around uh, political institutions to be assured that free and fair elections will happen more than once. And there's the risk that elections will take place and then the winners will prevent further choices from being made um, if the polity changes its mind. Um, and here we have a, a pretty basic recognition that in the context of politics, people need to have the right to choose more than once. And similarly, when we talk about disability service provision, often choice is conceptualized in this very, very narrow way. You have the right to choose between group home A, group home B, and an institution. You have the right to choose where you're going to live but we don't necessarily talk about the kinds of choices you should have the right to make after you make that decision. In a very real way, we run into this problem of one person, one choice, one time um, a lot when we discuss residential and employment service provision for people with significant disabilities because there's a great deal of focus that goes into that initial choice but not a great deal of focus into the kinds of choices that occur every day around when to eat, uh, when to wake up, who to spend time with, um, and the ability to revise our earlier choices. So I wanna close by saying that people with disabilities are fighting, in a very real sense, um, for some of the things that we consider characteristic of basic personhood in our society. Um, and the more we can acknowledge that fight, and the more we can orient our discussions around disability to the concrete and specific areas of conflict that drive disability policy forward and have over the course of many, many decades at this point, the more we can have a real conversation to ensure that the rights of citizenship, but also the rights of personhood are afforded to all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ari. Um, really thought-provoking and appreciate those comments. Um, we'll now end, I think we'll move right into Charlotte's comments so that we can then get started and launch into the discussion. Um, so Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sherry, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I, I wanted to start off by just saying that today across the globe, we're seeing a surge around the universal recognition of disability rights. And it's very important for us to recognize that this demand is predicated on and fueled by decades of struggle and, and results of the work of the global disability movement that Judy talked about. This movement has been a movement that has fought relent relentlessly for rights, for recognition, for dignity, and very importantly, for self-representation. The outcome of this struggle has been the construction of global, a global architecture around disability. In that regard, we now have the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has been ratified by 178 countries. Linked to that, or related to that, we also have the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda, which now frames development programming across the world. And so, again, very important in terms of thinking about where disability is globally. It's important for us to note that both of these, these frameworks have been replicated at regional level across the world. And in their replication, what we see is that they're nuanced based on regional characteristics. And they're seen as part of indigenization of the rights in that particular part of the world. As we speak, 
the African Union is about to commence the process of, of, of approving an African protocol for the rights of persons with disabilities. The World Disability Report, a World Bank and WHO, WHO collaboration, estimates that persons with disabilities make up at least 15% of, of the world's population, making us the world's largest minority. Our collective lived experience and mobilization at local level and country level has been directly, and I repeat, directly responsible for the rapid entry into force of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And, in, and, and then in turn, this convention and the engagement of persons with disabilities influenced the intergovernmental negotiations around the Sustainable Development Goals with the resultant effect of making them responsive to disability and firmly recognizing disability as part of the development agenda. Now, this would not have happened had it not been for the global disability movement. Increasingly, persons with disabilities across the globe have been shaping social and economic innovations, challenging social norms and values and breaking new ground. Similarly, it is pretty clear to me that the desire for recognition of one's own value and that of a community has driven the political engagement of persons with disabilities again across the globe. Today, across the world, we have countless numbers of parliamentarians with disabilities in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. In Ecuador, we have President Lenin Moreno, a president with a disability. In Argentina, we have a vice president, Marta Gabriela Michetti, a woman with a visible disability. And of course, we have our own Tammy Duckworth in the Senate. But we need more. And it's possible. We need more, and it's possible. And I'll tell you why I think it's possible. It's possible because we have ever more than before a robust and engaged base of persons with disabilities working at community level to galvanize and socialize our rights. It's also important for us to recognize that for the first time, these, these organizations, these groups, these people are connected via social media, connected as never before. Persons with disabilities are increasingly influencing the course of their communities and their countries. For example, based out of Nairobi, Kenya, a group of young African youth with disabilities have established a network using social media to share their experience and stand up for disability rights. They now have a platform for their shared beliefs as citizens with rights and dignities. This is very exciting. At the same time, we cannot ignore the fact that this population continues to face many, many obstacles. And these range from stigma, discrimination, marginalization, the lack of access to services, to opportunities, and very importantly, to voice in decision making. If we accept that the hallmark of citizenship is, is the intrinsic worth and, and the value of all people, and a concept that continues to evolve, then we also need to be mindful of the barriers that, that we experience. We also need to be mindful of the fact that our own sense of worth, as Judy pointed out, is not sufficient particularly where we live in situations and communities where the societal norms and practices do not recognize your worth. So you might think you have all the worth in the world, but if other people and the community doesn't see your value, doesn't see your worth, doesn't recognize your agency, then you're in a very difficult situation. I wanted to just quickly talk about the importance of higher education, because globally, students with disabilities in higher education remain underrepresented. 
We're seeing some increases in the OECD countries, but this is by far not enough. We know that on the employment front, we also see a lag in terms of em the employment of persons with disabilities. The International Labour Organization estimates that 360, 386 million people of working age have some kind of a disability, and that in some places, in some countries in the world, the unemployment rate for persons with disabilities is as high as 80%. This exclusion of persons with disabilities from education, from employment opportunities, as we know, is often compounded by the social disadvantage already experienced by persons with disabilities. And so, what does this mean in real terms? What it means for me is that too many young people with disabilities are not in education, are not in employment, and as a category, as a, as a group of people, they will be most affected by economic exclusion and linked to that multidimensional poverty. We therefore need to ensure that their economic, socioeconomic integration is put in place by tailored policies and programs. We need to see more robust efforts in higher education and really begin to systematically and in a system-wide way address the lag that we see. We also need to make institutions of higher learning more reflective of our demographics and of our diversity as a society. But I also just want to pick up on a point, and that is why we have seen globally an advancement in terms of uh, disability within the global disability movement, we're also having to contend increasingly with the politics of fear and populism. And this is happening in far too many parts of the world. In my view, this movement, this fear-based politics, seeks to redefine people as narrowly identified, identifying the in-group, and in so doing, really excludes large parts of the population as a whole and negates those of us who have intersecting identities. I think this is particularly disquieting for persons with disabilities because as people with disabilities, we all have intersecting identities. Mm -hmm. These identities could be gender, they could be race, they could be sexual orientation, they could be refugee status, they could be age, and so on. And so we cannot afford to valorize othering. Instead, we have to build a common narrative that is underpinned by respect, non-discrimination, solidarity, participation, and voice. And if we do this, we will, it'll enable us as a group to flourish, to belong, to recognize the struggles of those before us, and to thrive. If we fail to do this, there is a risk that the gains that we have made to date will be clawed back. They'll be diluted. They will be erased. There is also a risk that we will be made invisible. And there's also the risk of us unwittingly assuming new forms of oppression and suppression. This is particularly relevant as we move into the future of work, to which scientists have already started to warn us that rapid strides in the development of artificial intelligence and robotics could threaten the prospects of mass employment. And my question is, what does that mean for persons with disabilities? And so I contend that we have no choice but to continue bold and ambitious activism Activism that ensures that the aspirations of persons with disabilities are demanded and realized through active citizenship. And we constantly need to ask the question, what does this mean for persons with disabilities? Mm -hmm. We need to rewrite the narrative of active citizenship and civil participation to include persons with disabilities not as the exception, 
but as the rule. In shaping this narrative, we cannot and should not lose sight of the need to address the, the existing barriers that still exclude us. We need to challenge these barriers like Maria Alejandra Villanueva did. Maria is a young woman with Down syndrome who lives in Peru, and she was able to challenge a discriminatory government policy, and in so doing, nullified the policy that excluded people from cer with certain mental and intellectual disabilities from the electoral rolls. We need more Marias. We need to be seated at the table to construct dialogue between the disability movement, public institutions. We need to build alliances with broader civil society. We need to be part of political organizations. And of course, we need to be visible and active in the private sector if we're essential, if we are to move the discourse from inclusion to empowerment. And I want to repeat that because I think we really need to think about moving the discourse around disability from inclusion to empowerment. We know that facilitating disability inclusion enables the mobilization of a new genera generation, but we also need to see more young people with disabilities as economic and social resources, who can, as citizens, directly contribute to sustaining the, the, the stability and the economic growth of our country. However, we cannot do this alone. Using the capabilities approach, the work of SEN and Ausbom, we have advanced the, con the conceptualization of disability. But we need more of that. The work that my dear friends, Michael and Sherry lead, is well respected globally and highly sought after. We need more Sherry's, we need more Michael's. And so allow me, Chair, to use my last minute to invite academia to partner with us to better define the discourse around disability and citizenship on issues around how we measure participation. How do we enhance participation? There is a lot to do, and I hope this conference is the beginning of this journey. So let me just close with an African proverb that I think sums up my remarks and in many ways says it in a lot more eloquent way. And it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Okay, thank you very much, Charlotte. So um, I'm gonna kick off um, with a couple of questions for the panel um, that I think will touch upon the points brought up and maybe uh, bring up a few new points as well. Um, so if I could, Maria, I'm gonna tap you on the shoulder first since I'm sitting right next to you. Okay. <laughs> and um, I think it's really interesting to think about this cross-generational perspective um, in your experience now at the city of Houston, but also working with um, public engagement with the Obama White House, it seemed like you were really able to uh, bring together uh, a community of young voices of people with disabilities. And as we think about this ADA generation, obviously there's a very empowered, it's a very empowered lens. Um, but also conversely, do you think there's any risk there? Do you think that a younger generation is at risk of forgetting the past in any way and all the work that's been done? Or how are you seeing people respond to that? I don't, I don't think so. I actually think that the vast majority of youth with disabilities don't have access to the past, so they don't have a way to forget it. Um, there is still an enormous lack of recognition and awareness of disability history, and that's everything from a history of the disability rights movement to knowing that one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence was a person with a disability to recognizing that Harriet Tubman uh, was a disabled woman. Um, so I, and I also think that many young people with disabilities do not know and don't have a chance to learn what their rights are. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna probably a little bit mess up a saying from the self-advocacy movement, um, which is essentially that we invest so much time and energy and money in getting our children to talk, only to tell them to shut up, right? <laughs> um, and I, um, I think that for many youth with disabilities growing up today, um, at least for myself, um, 
because we have access to things like mainstream education, um, we are, the primary message that we receive about our disability is to pass. Yeah. Be as normal and as non-disabled as possible. And that is extremely toxic and it's extremely dangerous. Um, and so I think that once youth with disabilities are able to learn about the past mm -hmm. and learn about the fights, um, it is actually motivation to get more engaged. I also think youth with disabilities growing up now, like every young person in the country, is seeing how easily our rights can be threatened mm -hmm. and the importance of that vigilance that President Obama talked about. Um, I also think, too, many young people with disabilities are having to learn how to attack much more subtle but nonetheless dangerous forms of discrimination. So for example, young people with disabilities are growing up with the expectation that they will have a job. They prepare their resume, they put on their suits, they get an interview, they get to the interview, and are ultimately denied the job because they're told, you're just not the right fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't take, you're just not the right fit, and sue that employer for disability discrimination even though embedded in you're just not the right fit is you look different, that scares me, and I don't know if I can work with you, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and so I think that the tactics that youth will have to use um, to really dig into things like that, those subtle, um, subtle comments connected to much more dangerous forms of discrimination are gonna be different than mm -hmm. generations previous because they were attacking very explicit, yes. tangible forms of, exactly. of bias, so. Yeah. It does look a little different now. Yeah. But um, you know, I think I've, I've experienced many of uh, you know, the same things um, mm -hmm. from the standpoint of, I think that, that I, I know personally as I approached a career in medicine, for example, right. that probably a lot of my success, particularly early on when I didn't have a lot of mentors myself to look at, was the tactics of passing, of you know, keeping up and doing the job and, and making it work in whatever way would, would get it done at the end of the day, but not necessarily doing that with a positive identity of disability or bringing that to the table as well. Mm -hmm. um, Charlotte, on a similar vein, you talked a little bit about um, mobilization of, of younger generations in Africa. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, as we um, uh, you know, are living in a world with so much more interconnectedness uh, with regards to things like social media and um, and other uh, forms of, of, you know, reaching across borders. Do you see advocacy happen differently in places where people may not have previously been able to talk to each other as easily, and particularly those younger generations who are coming into it yeah. with that lens? So, I mean, I, I definitely see a lot more use of social media, um, but I, I think, you know, we also need to just acknowledge our own privilege. Mm -hmm. um, because in a lot of places where I work, um, just getting onto the internet is very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it costs a lot when you can, um, and so we need to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. But I do think that you know, there are groups, as I mentioned, the, the group that works out of Nairobi that works trans-Africa, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're really good. They're really good about sharing positive stories, um, about sharing you know, new laws that are coming up, um, and they, they are very, very engaged. Now. I think what that, that, the way that group was established was that it got some funding from um, the Open Society Foundation, which is great. But those type of things should be happening organically. Mm -hmm. be, my, my greatest fear is what happens when the funding runs dry. So it's really important for us to recognize these types of initiatives, mm -hmm. but find ways to make them indigenous to, to Nairobi, mm -hmm. yeah. to Lagos, or wherever it is. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's happening, but it could happen a lot more. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And Ari, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about, you know, in your work across um, policy and, and, you know, so many of the things that you said resonated, I know, personally with me with regards to, you know, having the choice to take risks and to be able to make that uh, decision independently. Um, have you seen, as we enter into this current political climate and with a lot of the challenges that we're in, do you see 
people from within the disability community um, becoming more engaged or as the challenges mount, you know, more disenfranchised or both? I mean, I think some people get fired up and want to be even more involved and other people just think it's just too much and the barriers are so high that they tend to pull back a little bit. Have you seen any major trends in that way? So of course the answer that I'd like to give and the answer that we're supposed to give in moments like this is that the disability the rights brilliant. movement is you know, <laughs> united as one, this right. overwhelming wave of uh, uh, passion and is voting as a block and the tragic thing is that it's not really true. Um, in so far as we have data, uh, we know that in general, people with disabilities follow, um, in terms of political opinions, mm -hmm. some of the same patterns as the broader public. Um, and you know, as Judy alluded to earlier, uh, usually folks don't take an identity first conception mm -hmm. of their disability. Um, and so, uh, you know, while we in some sense, you know, have a, a tens of millions of people large voting block. Practically, um, we haven't seen voting patterns um, really track with that. Now, there are some very significant ways in which the disability community does mobilize around candidates and policy issues that speak very directly mm -hmm. to their interests. I think we saw that in the context of um, uh, two years ago in the fight over Medicaid per capita caps and the uh, attempt to um, repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, we saw significant mobilization of the disability community and particularly of disability rights groups. Um, but you know, we, we, we're continuously facing this challenge that there's the disability rights community and the disability rights culture and infrastructure and so on um, and then there's this vastly larger um, group of people who just happen to have disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and if we want to um, increase the effectiveness of the disability rights community, we have to expand it to encompass more than just a small percentage of the disability community mm -hmm. because that's the way that we're going to start mm -hmm meaningfully influencing voting patterns and um, really come into political maturity as a stakeholder group. Yeah, it's a really important perspective, thank you. So we'll now open it up uh, to the audience for some Q&A. Um, so please, does anybody have a first question for the panelists? Looks like right here. Hi there. My name is Mandy Curtis. I'm um, a social worker who actually worked in the medical field for a few years, and now I run a private practice that works a little bit on disability. I've been legally blind since birth, and I do adaptive rock climbing. Um, I was thinking a lot about what we've discussed in terms of in-group and out-group citizenship and global participation. And I've noticed we've talked a lot about young people and youth and I think there's been kind of a focus of discussion on people who have had disability and kind of grown up with it from a young age. Mm -hmm. Something that I've interacted with a lot in my life and in my work is in fact <coughs> adults who have acquired disability or have maybe grown up with a condition but not known what it was or had their disability change the way their body functions over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I have come to some thoughts about this on my own, but I would love to open this up to a panel of people who are very experienced in these different ways and ask you, what do you think are ways that we, as a community, but within our societies and our cultures, kind of open the door for people who have experienced the shock and the, even the loss of acquiring a disability and having to relate to their body and to their community in a new way that they really maybe not they didn't really have control over at the time. How do we kind of make space for that complicated journey and integration of possibly acquiring a new identity? Sherry, can I maybe take a shot yeah. at that? Absolutely. Um, so I, I was injured in a car crash as an adult. I just graduated from law school. Um, and so I complete, I mean, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, acquiring a disability at that age uh, for me was, I had a life like before and after. It was really that clear. And it was also very clear to me about how people perceived me, mm -hmm. right? And so 
there was a lot of, there was a lot of learning, aside from the fact that I was learning my own body, um, people around me were having to learn how to interact with me. Because there, was, there continued to be this fear, if you want, this subliminal fear mm -hmm. about you know, my newly acquired disability. Um, I had you know, a lot of people who were praying for me every day. Mm -hmm. That didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had you know, a lot of people who just couldn't deal with it. They just could not deal with it. Uh, but then I had some amazing people. I mean, my family was incredible. I had a lot of people who just really made sure that I was given all of the opportunities to make sure that I, con that I could continue to do, to do the work that I wanted to do. Uh, on a personal level, um, I was also very clear that I didn't want to be the disability lawyer, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so for the first couple of years, I was totally not engaged in the disability agenda. I was working on children's rights. I was working on social and economic rights. I did not want to be pigeonholed as the disability lawyer. But as we know, that doesn't last for too long. <laughs> Increasingly, my work on children's rights were about children with disabilities. <laughs> Increasingly, my work around prisoners' rights was to find out what was happening with prisoners with disabilities. And then I just thought, you know, I just need to be true to myself and call it. Um, and, and I think, obviously, it was the best thing I've ever done. Uh, but I do think that there's a transition, and people experience that very differently. Um, but yeah, so that was my story. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. <laughs> what was your name? Mandy. Mandy, Mandy, that was a, a fantastic question, and I'm so glad you raised it. Um, the vast majority of people with disabilities in the United States are older adults. Mm -hmm. And they're older adults who have most likely aged into disability. Mm -hmm. And so to kind of <coughs> add color to what Ari was saying about voting blocks and how we don't kind of vote as a big disability vote, it's because the, the majority of those voters Mm -hmm. are older adults who will say things like, I just don't hear as well as I used to, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the vast majority of people that I work with uh, in my office in Houston are older adults. And so when I am usually on the phone with, let's say, a 70-year-old woman with limited English who is becoming blind due to diabetes, and she is talking to me about how scared she is and about how much, how hard this is for her, the first thing that I have to do is respect that. Mm -hmm. What I cannot do uh, is say, oh, but it's okay to be disabled and you should have disability <laughs> pride, right? I, I, I can't do that. That's gonna shut down the conversation. Um, and what I find myself doing many times is very, very slowly trying to not only connect individuals to resources, but to community. Mm -hmm. um, because what I have found is that community can save lives. And um, I have a story here. So during Hurricane Harvey, um, I think one of the greatest public health crises that Houston faced was older adults who, again, aged into disability, were not connected to disability support systems, and were living very tentative existences. Um, and we worked with a man, his name was Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson was blind because of a car accident. Um, he had diabetes and he had lymphedema in his legs. His leg wraps um, became contaminated with flood water. And so his legs became infected. And so um, he was at significant risk of losing his legs. And it was always tricky to call Mr. Johnson because uh, he couldn't, he had not been taught to use assistive technology um, and was blind, so you would have to call him and leave a voicemail, which he would then try to write down to call you back. And he couldn't tell us what kind of leg wraps he needed because he couldn't see the labels and wasn't connected to people who could come in um, and read them for him. And so what we did was basically sent out a disability welcoming wagon to Mr. Johnson's house so that he could see, one, people with mobility, uh, limited mobility, who were able to help him, right? These are the folks that brought him food. 
and connect him to other blind folks. And I remember he called me three months later and he, he said, you know, Miss Maria, thank you for introducing me to Maria and Michael. They saved my life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, we, I think we need to develop better systems of exposing people who are aging into disability to, to community. Uh, because to them, it's just a sign of their fragility and their mortality, uh, which if we're all being honest with ourselves, they're very hard to contend with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I was struck, uh, and I've been struck over the course of the last several years, um, by how the disability community and the idea of disability culture really needs to be referred to more in the plural um, than in the singular, um, you know, and, and it's, it's very challenging because we want to be able to say, uh, well, people with disabilities want this. Um, you know, folks say, people with disabilities want you to refer to them with person-first language, but in reality, for some communities, that's not the case. The autistic community, the deaf community, the blind community, um, there's often a preference for identity-first language. We want to be able to say, People with disabilities don't want to cure. Well, for many disability groups, folks do very intensely want to cure. And for others, we very intensely don't. Um, and I think the challenge that we run into is we built this really powerful political coalition that came together to pass the ADA and defend it and to fight for disability rights in a variety of contexts. Um, but that political coalition, is really a hodgepodge of dramatically different kinds of experiences and people who think of themselves in dramatically different ways. Um, and so the more that we can start thinking of the first point of contact for especially folks with newly acquired disabilities, but even folks who've grown up with their disabilities but are looking for disability community for the first time, to be their, their native part of the disability community, um, rather than tr trying to take our political coalition and, and turn it into something that it really hasn't been, except for a small number of people culturally, um, I think the better off we're going to be. Um, and there, the good news is, is that there are a lot of folks doing that. And, there are a lot of folks doing excellent work to um, continue to build and grow and expand the different disability cultures that carry such resonance for so many different people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so with that, actually, that was such a rich question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and such a rich discussion that we used up the time. Now, um, I will say that um, I think all of our panelists would be very open to um, answering further questions one on one. Um, after this formal session ends, uh, but I also don't want to cut into people's break time, which is of course very important. So with this, we'll break. Um, how long, Becky? Tw for 25 minutes. Uh, please remember that there are um, accessible bathrooms. There's plenty of folks in the back. Just please ask if you have any questions regarding where to find that. Um, and let's please have another round of applause for our amazing panelists, Maria, Ari, and Charlie. See you back very soon. Thank you. <laughs>